Grow CFO is where finance leaders grow together. Join thousands of like-minded professionals using Grow CFO to access the combined knowledge and experience of the finance leader community. You can join us today at growcfo.net. Hello and welcome to the Grow CFO Show. I'm your host, Kevin Appleby, and today I've got Jim Simpson from ZipTech with me. And we're going to talk about the challenges of AI, automation, and all those good things to you, the leader, keeping up to date, understanding what's going on, and generally making the most of it. So, Jim, welcome to the Grow CFO Show. Thank you very much indeed, Kevin. Jim, tell me a little bit about you before we get into the meat of the subject. I've been sort of around the technology industry, in the technology industry, and around accounting, actually, for a very, very long time. I went to university and did a business degree, and that's how I first got into accounting and also technology. For my sins, I'm I'm a part-trained accountant, but I didn't go that route. I went into the technology industry, worked initially for IBM, and then because I was partly an accountant, understood how accounting works. I ended up working for accounting vendors way back a long time ago, one of the early PC vendors called Pegasus. I ran the commercial team there. And then a company called uh, Keeble Systems, they owned a system called Omicron. And then a company called uh, Systems Union, who had a, a revolutionary system in its day called Sun Systems. And that sort of led me down a path of keeping a foot in both camps. But, I, but these days, I'm merely a, mainly a technologist. There's some names there, Jim, that conjure up memories. I, I remember Pegasus. I remember yeah. that just about the time I passed my accountancy exams, we were helping clients get their heads around implementing Pegasus as an accounting system. And I, yeah, I yeah. did gather a bit of knowledge to be able to advise people back in the day. But Systems Union and Sun Systems, that reminds me of a probably the biggest consulting project that I was ever on. It was was working for, well, Coopers and Librand initially, but PwC. And we were implementing resource accounting in the army. We got the job of connecting the army's asset systems to the accounting system. Mm -hmm. Loads and loads of military equipment that has never, ever been on a balance sheet. (laughs) And we actually implemented Systems Union, Sun Accounts, fixed asset register to put it all in and i'll never forget the the conversation over dinner with my project director when he told me we set the program going it's still going 24 hours on calculating the banking depreciation (laughs) please give me an excel spreadsheet i could do it quicker (laughs) (laughs) pwc the way back at that time i imagine it's the same time actually used some systems right throughout the world because of its multi-currency features so you were at that time a very big uh, systems union client. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But these days it's ZipTech. After my experience at, at systems union, I ended up uh, by accident running R&D because I had very strong opinions on what the product should do. So I ended up uh, running this development operation of about 200 people, which is quite an experience as I'm not a professional programmer. But I learned a lot. But I also got very close to some of the investors. And after... Systems Union was sold on. I ended up working for them as a turnaround CEO. So I did a number of turnaround uh, situations, usually bringing with me a CFO. So all software companies that were in trouble, 50 to 100 staff, that kind of thing. And that's actually what led me to set up ZipTech. Because one of the eternal frustrations I had was the IT was very badly run. And the developers, because they're all software companies that I was doing turnarounds on, The developers were all fiddling with the IT. And of course, we were in a turnaround situation. I wanted them to the right product so that I could get it out the door to bring in revenue and to fix the problems for the reasons why people weren't paying us and all that kind of thing. And so I worked to outsource it. And I found it incredibly hard, which is what, I mean, it was, if you were very, very small, the local one-man band at the time could have done it. If you were very, very big, something like PwC could have done it. But there was that mid-sized companies all found it very, very hard, which was what led me to set up ZipTech. So we're IT consultants. We help guide and advise managers on the technology and what they should be doing. We help them implement it, and then we run it for them as well. We don't do that necessarily. We do versions of that for, for all of our clients. Which must put you in a great place to see what's going on 
in the world at the moment around automation and artificial intelligence. Yeah, and and the cloud is inextricably linked into this as well, because most of this, I mean, all of the R&D dollars now are going into cloud technology. So the cloud is a component of all of this. Um, And I think larger enterprises are already beginning to do this to almost a surprising degree. But medium-sized businesses are just starting to become aware of the impact this is likely to have on business in general and specifically their business. And therefore, there's this huge interest in in it, very practical interest. So, so, So what can we automate? What are the things we should be looking at? How do we go about doing it and and kind of what are the tools that we should be using? There's a huge interest in it at the minute. Okay. So give me some examples of that. I was having lunch with an IT director today, somebody who'd been a client of ours, and their automations were really very interesting. So they do a lot of, they look after properties. So they have uh, robots who clean floors. They have robots that cut grass. And they have removed a huge proportion of their admin and manual type things. And they can see that it's going going to go much, much, much further. Another example is somebody who had a very big manual payroll. And it was a very, the process of, the actual calculation wasn't manual, but the reporting process of what the pay should be, because it varied, was manual. We put together a system for them to collect the data, authorize the data, and pump it into the payroll. So instead of taking two weeks to do the thing, it could be done in a matter of days. And most importantly, more accurately. So that's another example. Another example is a very, very simple one. We always advise people when they're starting automation to bite off little chunks, small chunks at a time, learn slowly because it is going to be a journey. So a very simple one that we put into our business some time ago was a little bot. We call our bot Zippy because we're ZipTech. And every week, uh, Zippy goes off and it checks who is going to be in for the week and who has holidays booked and who's going to be out. And it just compiles a little email. It sends it to reception, tells reception who's going to be out. It also tells reception who's in call for, for out of hours call service as well. And Zippy also, every single morning at about 9.30, sends us all the messages in team, just a little table saying, who's like that day? Now, that's very small. And I actually thought it was so trivial when we originally did it that it wasn't worth doing. I probably am actually one of the biggest users of it now. I find it tremendously useful to go to the ZipTech channel in Teams and see who is not in that day, because it makes my life easier to try and get in contact with them or whatever. I know I can't for a week. So little things like that. Wow. Yeah. Something as simple as that, but the way that changes the way we can work, improves the way we can work, is is quite mind-boggling. I know, and I didn't appreciate that. Yeah, it's really useful. And there you've got an example of an automation that's not taking anybody's job away, Nope. Doing something that, if you asked a, a PA to do it, would be a real weekly chore, and giving you some very, very needed business information, some insight. So, now, I suppose we are all frightened about automation and AI taking our jobs away. How do you feel yes. about that? Well, in our case, it hasn't taken everybody's jobs away. It's actually growing, enabled us to grow because our biggest issue. One of our biggest issues, and I know it is for many companies, is finding really high quality, capable staff. It's a genuine issue. They, it's hard to find really good people. So what we want to do is make the most of those people and surround them with as much automation and information so that they can be far, far more effective in their jobs. Mm. However, having said all of that, that's great for us as a technology company. I think there is no doubt that this will displace jobs and people will have to retrain. There will definitely be retraining involved because you know you can see it in large-scale enterprises where 
you know, what we just talked about is 10 minutes of somebody's job once a week. But you scale that up to an organization that's very, very huge, you can take out one process. And actually, it might be the equivalent of two or three people. Yeah. So there's no doubt it will take out jobs. But I think it's up to us to try and help people reskill. If we've got really good people, we'd like to keep in the business. It um, actually reminds me, Jim, of, of a challenge that, that I've come across for years and years around shared services projects. Mm -hmm. Companies will put a shared service together to allow them to automate processes, to allow them to simplify processes, get people that specialize in particular tasks because they can do yeah. the same task for three organizations. Now, you can always see direct savings where you can take out a whole person's job. But in put together many business cases for shared services, there's always a rump of things where you're going to make take away 10% of what somebody does. 15%. Now, if you maybe you, you can see five whole people you can take away, but you can see 10% of maybe 50 jobs you can take away. Yeah. Are you going to lose those 50 people? Nearly always, you can't reorganize or whatever to actually lose heads. The challenge is to make use of the time you're freeing up to get those people being more productive. I, I agree. I describe it as create for my, many businesses it creates capacity. Mm. So it creates capacity for growth, for better customer services, better quality and that kind of thing. Um, but we shouldn't shy away from the fact that it, for some individual instances and so forth, it will destroy or stop jobs happening. But when you look back at what the internet has done, and we talk about all the jobs it is destroyed and it has, you're in the photography industry, if you work for Kodak, for example, that no longer exists and all that kind of thing because of the iPhone, those jobs have gone, but many, many more have been created. And if you're an optimist, then you believe that actually more jobs are going to be created um, through this process, a kind of process of creative destruction. Mm. So... There's a huge amount of change coming up, and certainly in the predictions that Gross CFO put together at the start of the year, this sort of technology is at the center of two or three of those nine predictions. Um, if you want to look at those, I'll put a link in the show notes to them. Mm -hmm. um, but what about the average business leader just sort of getting their head around what's happening? How on earth do you keep yourself up to date, abreast with this? and knowing it, when you should be taking advantage of it. It is incredibly hard. And I think business leaders now have to, because change is so significant and so fast, I think business leaders have to devote some time in a week or month to learning or exposing themselves to this kind of thing. And what I find is if we give them examples of how this technology has been used in real businesses and real things. I think what I find is uh, you can see them figuring out, oh, that would do that in my business and so forth. And they can translate it to their own business. So we run something called the director's briefing at the London School of Economics. And it's, a, it's specifically for business leaders, not IT people. And in fact, we ran one last week on, on the subject of automation, funny enough, and 50% of the business leaders that turn up are finance directors or CFOs, because very often they end up with responsibility for IT. The other half are all CEOs. And what we try and do is in, biz in plain business language, not techie language, tell them about what's going on, give them examples and show them those examples as well. And I really think it makes a big difference actually seeing it rather than just talking about it and showing them some PowerPoints. And the other thing that we do in the director's briefing, it's a deep dive, it's two and a half hours. So it's a, it's a commitment to come along, you're serious about it. It's two and a half hours and it's only for six people. And the reason why we do that is it's a facilitated discussion. We want people to be saying, well, I've tried some of that, but that didn't work. Or, oh, I did it, but it worked and it worked this way. So we want to create that kind of interaction between the business leaders deliberately to shape the status quo. Okay, get that. How do you make sure you're getting the right people along? There must be a lot of people that, that are saying, 
I'm not using any of this. I've really got to suck up some information that would be coming on that sort of briefing session just to take. I, so, inevitably, there so, are people who do that. Inevitably, that's, that is true. But what we find is some people get it faster. Some people not as fast. So, in fact, we, we get some people who will come back to the same briefing a couple of times. And they will get it. Some people will get it immediately and want uh, and want to do it. Mm, yeah. So, Jim, one of the things that seems to have suddenly hit the headlines recently is OpenAI mm-hmm. and a lovely little uh, chat device that can, yep. can write stuff for you. Now, that suddenly hits the headlines. That must be one example that's come to public knowledge of, but there are hundreds and hundreds of things that haven't. How do you think that that sort of tech is going to impact on us? So we talked about that at this director's briefing last week, actually. And the audience reaction or the participants' reaction was interesting. Absolutely everybody in the room had heard about it. But only a very small number had actually logged on and played with it and so forth. So they were relying on sort of headlines as to what it actually did and so forth. So the first thing I advise everybody to do is, is, I'm sure you've done it as well, Kevin, is to go to OpenAI, start an account, which is a very, very easy thing to do, and just play with that. And I think, so you've got to remember that two years two years ago, we were nowhere near where ChatGPT is now, nowhere near it. And in two years' time, we will be hugely forward from what we are in life. So the minute we, we're using it internally mm. already, no, there are caveats to using it, but we should get those out of the way first. Yeah. First of all, it exists in a world that stopped in 2021. So it's working on, a, on an internet database for 2021. It is a beta product. It's not a full re- uh, release production product, and it does suffer from something the AI people rather euphemistically call hallucinations. And a hallucination, really, for for those of us who speak plain English, is where the chat engine makes up the answer. Yes. (laughs) I haven't got one, so it makes one up. And you have to be aware of all of those things. Having said that, so ChatGPT is, is a great language-based bot, and it's really light years beyond anything I've seen. So you can use it for a number of things already, and we are. So, for example, we often are writing scripts or, or programs to adjust something in somebody's uh, network or rule things out or whatever. And a programming language is just another language. So, in fact, ChatGPT is very good at either giving you an initial program if you ask it to do things or checking something and finding the errors in something that you have written. So we're actually using it right now. The other thing that we use it for as well is research. Don't forget, it's research that stopped in 2021. So, for example, it doesn't know that the queen is dead, for example. So, But it is a useful tool for research. Some people are using it for marketing and to write marketing copy, to write a blog post, to write a LinkedIn post, or whatever it is. The problem with it there, I find, is it's very nicely written. And if you read it a second time, there's no information in it. Mm. It's very bland. So it's a fabulous tool that is not yet production ready, but is still being used by people like us in circumstances where we know it is useful and dependable. Yeah. And well, I, I think, think it's going to be fantastic seeing seeing how this develops. And we're, we're actually in Grow CFO, we're using a version of the same thing. It's a product called Jasper. Yes. It's specifically intended to write blog posts and so on. I can think on countless occasions around this podcast, I've gone into a topic in a lot of depth with a guest. Oh, I've now got to sit and write three introductory paragraphs about this in the show notes. And you sit at the keyboard and you just get complete writer's block. I know. I'll go ask Jasper. And you put the right information in. Wallop, Jasper gives you three paragraphs. 
or whatever. And I'll agree with you exactly as you've said. Occasionally, I've seen it make stuff up because we've been talking about such a technical subject, it doesn't actually know anything about it. Yeah. I find that that happens more the further away you get from the marketing world, the harder it is. If you go into something that's very specific, very technical, it just doesn't know. But also that idea that as you read it the second time, it hasn't actually told you anything. Some very nice words, which actually is ideal for three introductory paragraphs. <laughs> Absolutely. And we've used it for the same thing as well, Kevin. So we use it for research and saying, if we wanted to write a blog post or whatever, what way could we structure it? What information should we include? We then look at that and decide what we should, what is real, what is then made up, and what we'd like to include. And then we tell it, you write a blog post on this subject covering these three or four areas. And then what we do is we go through and tweak it a bit. And if you go through that kind of iterative process, it does it very well. And people say, oh, that's no good. Well, I can tell you, I can write a blog. We can go through that whole process much faster than it can. I can do it with a clean sheet of paper in front of me on the desk. Yes, definitely. Another one that I love, we're using something called Otter. Yeah. This podcast, for instance, once it's been edited, I'll take the audio file, I'll put it into Otter, and it'll transcribe. I tend not to do very much with the transcription, but it does a very clever thing that within the show notes that I publish, we put a set of timestamps, sort of, oh, at three minutes, we were talking about this. At five minutes, we were talking about this. Otter is clever enough to give me those points in the conversation. I always have to go in and edit some of the text because it's possibly lost a little bit of the meaning or it's misspelt something things like zip tech it doesn't know what they are it'll put but, something else in instead of that but, but compared to you doing that manually it's yes, nothing yeah. i used to spend best part of 30 minutes to come up with 10 lines of here are the key timestamps now i just cut and paste yeah. and say do i do yeah they feel like the right things do i need to change the text and i think that sums up the best use for that tool at the minute or for me anyway, is we're using it as an assistant. Yes. It's an assistant. It's not replacing me. It's not replacing any of my people, any of my engineers who are writing scripts. It's helping them do it. It's helping them check for problems and bugs and so forth and debug it. Yeah. So, Jim, when you're doing director's briefings, so you're coming across a lot of finance folk in those. Where are you seeing these sorts of technologies coming and making an impact specifically on the finance world? So finance, often the starting point, there's a couple of early points or early implementations in the finance world. Uh, Getting data out, manipulating it and shooting it into another system. Figuring out one system, manipulating it, putting it in. Perhaps based on some triggers, if this happens, do that kind of thing. So that classic thing of the whole data manipulation integration. Uh, The second area, I would say, is around uh, reporting and KPIs. Yeah. And there is a lot you can do in this area. There's a big crossover or overlap with business intelligence here, because business intelligence can look at data, analyze, and therefore, you can kick off automations based on that information. So I find that the finance is wanting to take data very often from multiple systems, put it in a single database or data mark, whatever you want to call it, and then analyze that data and display it in a way that's meaningful for the business and update it constantly and then kick off processes or activities because of it. Yeah. One of the interesting ones I'm certainly starting to hear a lot about is the sort of software that can look for errors. Yeah. And we're quite excited, really, about what's that going to do to, say, the month-end close. You you will inevitably spend part of your month-end close cycle looking at the numbers, saying, are these right, and correcting errors, Posting journals, things like that, to get to a, a set of numbers you're pretty pretty reasonable uh, and near enough right. If you've got a piece of software running all month and says, oh, that sales invoice looks wrong, think you should have a look at it, that is going to be powerful. 
I agree. And they're very, very good at pattern recognition. Yeah. They can look at things and see things, for example, that we cannot and save us a heck of a lot of time. And then, of course, long before month end, that problem is corrected. I think the, the best story I've heard about pattern recognition is to do with x-rays or CT scans in a medical situation where the computer can spot the patterns more quickly than the consultant can. The consultant then checks the material. And if the consultant believes the computer system's got it wrong, it feeds that back in and the computer system then learns from that because it's learning as well based on the amount of data. Oh, that doesn't mean that the patient is that. And that's dealing with vastly more data than we're dealing with in an accounting situation or a business situation. Mm. Does this mean that the, at the football match we'll eventually get VAR telling the referee what the decision might be <laughs> rather than the other way around? Might be some different results by then. <laughs> then. One of the things that, that we've done in my business that I sort of cite as an example of this whole business intelligence thing is to do with API board that we created for our support function. And I credit, I believe, I can't prove this, Kevin, but I believe that that KPI board has been worth millions to Zipcac. And it's only a single sheet or board of KPIs. Yeah. And it's gone through a number of iterations if we've learned about what truly is key, because what you think is key is not, and you peel back the layer and you find something more key behind it. It's like putting back layers of an onion. But what that's enabled us to do is provide real-time information to the support team on problems that customers are having, any trends, any customers that have a lot of tickets open suddenly, which is usually an indicator of significant problem, how long tickets are open, how quickly they're getting solved, et cetera, et cetera. And we put that information in front of the team and we update it something like every 60 seconds or so. So it's it's dynamic. It's all ever changing. And we have a support huddle every morning, all the engineers at 11 o'clock. And they have the huddle around that virtual board. That has changed our behavior. It has definitely improved our performance as a business, given better results and value to our clients, which in turn, of course, has one of a lot of business through referrals, but also has made us more efficient internally. So we don't do the things that don't matter. And that single board, I I believe, has been worth millions to us. I love that. And that's taking on a concept that's and back in PwC days, I was part of a team called iAnalytics. Mm-hmm. But this is 20 years ago. So we're living with a different level of technology. But one of the things that we'd say if we're going to help a client put a balanced score, scorecard together or a board report together. Yes. Can you go into your meeting? and run your entire meeting based on the information that's on this yes. piece of paper. And we got some of the journey there, but the, the challenge was always either the systems weren't able to produce the right data mm-hmm. or we couldn't get the data fast enough to be relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Neither is our data 60 seconds out of date. Yeah. And exactly. actually, we've chosen 60 seconds. We could do it faster, but it's kind of meaningless to mm, do it faster yeah, than that. Yeah. The other one that we do, again, is a scorecard around a notoriously difficult thing to do, project profitability. It is very, very yeah. easy to lose money doing projects, really easy. And what we do is, again, we have a, a scorecard around that. And that scorecard, we have a meeting around. So the professional services team have a meeting around that scorecard. They will use the data in that scorecard and they will drill down into the data and find out what's happening and why a project is suddenly not behaving as it should be. And then they take a series of corrective actions as a result of that and they meet around that. I'd love to have had that sort of tool when I was running a bid team. Because I was always going under the bid team around actually not project profitability, but bid cost. And say, how much effort can you put into this bid until you get to the point where you've actually spent all of the profit on the project before you actually win it? Yeah. It, I mean, it's the first time I've seen anything like that. But interestingly, the young guys in the company using this, they take it for granted, <laughs> which is yeah. really interesting. I, 
this is close to you know this is close to magic i've never seen any they get been able to get this kind of data before yeah and it, this is another issue older chaps like us how do we get our heads around some of this and one of the funniest things i remember was that uh, you know putting something in front of a youngster and um, very young and mm -hmm. great at this lovely screen and every first thing was trying to touch the screen to make things happen. Of course, <laughs> it wasn't a touch screen piece of kit at all. Yeah. I had got my head around that quite easily. Younger generation automatically assumed it would be. There's definitely a something about what you grow up with. And I, I still fear the day. And I remember this from my own father repeatedly telling him how to use a video recorder. I just wonder, is there a day that you wake up and suddenly technology doesn't make any sense anymore. Yeah, there may well be. I mean, maybe we'll have some derivative of a, or some descendant of Alexa that will make it much easier for people to interface with without maybe Alexa become an avatar. Yeah, and you, you probably heard that, that Jim uttered the, uh, the name of she who should not be mentioned in the middle of a podcast, and she decided <laughs> to intrude. <laughs> <laughs> I won't mention the name again. <laughs> uh, but maybe we'll have some derivative of that, something, the kind of technology that you don't have to be a technologist to use. So my granddaughter is seven, and she uses Alexa all the time for everything and just takes it as, as easy to do. But also my wife, who knows nothing about tech, te um, technology whatsoever, she can also use Alexa. Yeah, because the interface is so good, and I think that's also true, frankly, of the iPad because the the Apple interface is is you know superb. Yeah, which says a lot of this isn't down to techies writing great code, writing programs that can do some really clever things. There's a big part here to be played by designers. People yeah, I understand agree. Understand how the brain works. We as a business like to think we're pretty clever in terms of technical stuff, but our principal focus, the sort of Tip of the arrow, as it were, is actually the ability to explain it to people, to business leaders who are not technical in plain English and give them guidance and advice. So we have a number of fractional chief technology officers who are hired specifically to do that. So we spend a lot of time doing that. I think those business leaders I mentioned earlier on simply have to accept they must devote a little bit of time to this because it's changing so fast. And for many businesses, this could well be an existential threat yeah. if they don't get on top of it. That, and each cycle is happening faster, so they don't have as long to learn. That idea of that fractional chief technology officer or that part of the CFO that's looking after technology, interesting take on that. The role isn't necessarily there to, to understand and drive the tech. It's there to explain the tech and the art of the possible to the non-technical yeah. person. It's a bit of both. And in fact, our, our fractional CTO normally reports, very often reports, to the uh, to the finance function, to the CFO, very often. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, that has been absolutely fascinating. Before I wind up, is there any question that I should have asked you today that I've forgotten? I just probably one. So all of this stuff is fantastic and it is going to change our businesses. But... We do have to manage it, and managing it is different from what we used to do with PCs and networks. So managing all of this stuff, AI, business intelligence, the cloud system that runs on is complex. So you, it's a very different kind of technology from what we've been used to. So you will need to put in place some proper process, tools and people to manage that technology because those are the foundations of all of the things that we've talked about today, Kevin. Yeah. What sort of person or people would you be looking at there? So I think it's not one person because it's too big for one person now. I think you need a range of people or a team of people. And I think you need advice. Basically, we're taking this model for large enterprises. They know this very well. At the top, they've got a, a CIO or whatever who is very good at understanding the technology, understanding it, how it applies to the to the business, and explaining it to the managers. Yeah. You've then got a group of people beneath that 
whose job it is to manage the networks in the system, not support users, but to prevent users ever, ever having problems. And then beneath that, you've got a help desk. And basically that model works. That model will still work in the future, but it will require different expertise within it. So I think you need to go looking for guidance and advice, somebody managing these very complex networks now, but also a help desk. Okay. And I would advise people to do to look for that kind of support and guidance and advice. Yeah. Is there going to be an issue there? And we've touched already on skill shortages. Now we're yes. talking about here is a completely new set of skills. Therefore, there aren't many people with those skills and a technology that's growing exponentially. Yeah. Is that going to give us a problem? I do believe so, Kevin. We're talking about early computers we used a few minutes ago. The first computer I used didn't have a screen. It had a paper roll, yeah. <laughs> which gives me a bit. Mm. But back from those days of the mini computers, very few mini computers made the transition over to be PC experts. Mm. Also, I remember back in the day, uh, a product called Novell was the networking product. It, oh, ran, yes. it was just Microsoft didn't do anything in networks or anything like that. It was the networking product. But so many of those Novell engineers did not make the transition into the Microsoft Windows networking and stack that we have today. And I see the same happening where people who are traditional IT people are not making that transition into this cloud-based world that enables us to run automation, AI, and business intelligence. Mm. So there's something there that says there have been these seismic shifts before, mm -hmm. taking those two things. The skills haven't existed. The technology has risen very fast, but we've survived. So Absolutely. we yeah. New people have come in, and I do think it is new entrants. So I think traditional IT finds it difficult to jump that hurdle each time, whatever the tradition is. And I think you have to look for new people who are versed in this to help your business drive forward. Jim, that has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for being this week's guest on the Grow CFO Show. Thank you, Kevin. It's been a pleasure.